Uh, obviously, the sleeping row is right here in the front. Good night, Michael. Help you. <laughs> Sounds like you had a fun time last night. Could have been out causing too much trouble. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Questions are welcome at any time. I prefer to be interrupted rather than save them to the end. Uh, there will be a little opportunity at the end, but uh, don't hesitate to fire questions at any time. Slides will be shosted, posted on SlideShare uh, under my handle, and uh, we can get started with that. I come from that place, Utah. For those of you who don't know quite the geography of the United States, Utah is, is kind of the left of the center. It's a high mountainous area. Kind of a fun place. Um, and has this little corner of it, part of, part of where the state is cut out, that is this location called Park City, Utah, or otherwise known as the People's Republic of Park City, because we don't associate with any of the rest of the state. We are on the other side of the Zion Curtain. Nobody knows who we are. We are different. We don't believe in Trump. We don't vote for Trump. We don't know what happened, how Trump got there. <laughs> in the winter, you will find me up there. In the summertime, you will find me down there. Um, my, my part of the world is a whole lot of fun to go visit. Good, good place to play. My finger is not smart, sharp enough for this. And of course, to kick everything off, there is the obligatory self-introduction. Uh, you know, why should you listen to me? There really is no reason. Yeah, I've been doing Joomla stuff for longer than, you know, as long as most of the people around here. Um, I hung around with the trademark group, caused all kinds of trouble there, uh, safely recovered from that. Yeah, I've been working with governance, marketing, all kinds of things for a while. It's, uh, it's been a fun time in the project. You'll kind of hear a little bit more about that tomorrow. This is what it looks like around my corner of the world. In the wintertime, this is the view. I work at the top of the aerials and moguls competitions at the World Cup held at Deer Valley. This is the top of the longest moguls competition run in the world. Uh, the final step before going to the Olympics. I have to tell you, it is a rather exhilarating experience to be up there because it's really deep, <laughs> really steep, and uh, rather exciting to go down. I also catch people as they're, they're landing off of this, a part of the crew that will be underneath there, filling the divots that they leave in the snow, big holes where they land and just you know leave their mark. So we try to keep that going for them. And this is where people do really interesting tricks off the top and, and have a good time. Most of these competitions are done at night because they can see better. So I work with this project called Elevating, Elevated, um, The Elevating Project. It's about substance abuse recovery. Some of you heard about that during the breaks. And now, this is not how to open a session. <laughs> you start out without a slide like this one that's got your branding, your information. It's not about you. Nobody came here to, to learn who you are. You think you need to open with background because you need credibility? No. They came here to hear what you have to say that will help them. You are the audience. You want to know what's good here. So you switch the branding. You use the venue's branding. You make it about what the people are interested in. You put the top, your topic up first. Perhaps put up your photo so that on YouTube they can remember who the speaker was on the opening frame so that they know they're finding the right video if, if it's been video recorded. But otherwise, the, the, all the content is aimed at the audience and what the audience is interested in. Not about branding yourself or, or promoting your, your business or service. You do that later. That's last. So instead, you also don't open with, hello, my name is. Very weak. On the television news, you hear a newscaster and they are at the situation, uh, the latest terrorist attack that Trump has caused. And, you, and they step up there and they say, I'm Duke, reporting live from, I'm Duke. Stronger statement, short, simple, to the point. Use it every time. You're there for a reason. Pro promote that, have that strength of character. If you come off with that type of confidence, that presence, everyone will just assume, yes, you must be the authority. You are in the right place. You are here to speak to us. So that simple opening becomes simply, I'm Duke. That's all you have to say. Keep it simple. If you've got someone who can do an introduction for you, use it. 
It is far better to have someone else do, sing your praises than you try to sing your own. It is far better for you to just simply start with your message. But the drawback of having someone introduce you is all of a sudden it becomes their five-minute show to tell a cute story and dig into some interesting thing about your background. Did you know that Duke spends all his time on the top of ski hills or you know, some silly thing that they're going to go on and on about using up valuable talk time? So write your introduction and ask them to read it exactly. You can write it in third person. It does not sound boastful or bragging to have someone else read. Duke is a 38-year member of the Ski Patrol. It's just that you know, bit of that trivia that helps people get a, a connection. So if you have the opportunity to be introduced, use it. So much for tip number one. We've got nine to go. Next up, when the machine decides it wants to, to present it to us. My fingers are not small enough for the buttons. It gets to be a little bit of a challenge. If I get out the grinder, it might help. But as, as covered before, this, the talk is not about you, so you do not want to lead with your bio or your background. You know, you get a reaction just like that. Oh my gosh, Ski Patrol, you must be so cool. Baloney. <laughs> it helps to build a connection. I do find out after a talk who all the skiers are in an audience. And we share stories about standing on the top of that hill, looking down, and it's almost straight down. And oh my gosh, are we going to go? <laughs> But other than that, um, it does not add value to the, the content of the talk. And your bio will come later. It comes in a later sequence when you, when you build out your talk according to um, the interests that are important. Because you need to start out with a story. Not humor, a story. Audiences perceive you and receive you far better if they have an emotional connection. The way you get that emotional connection is to start telling stories. You heard them yesterday. We, we can all relate to having a mother who does not like having her computer changed and so therefore is much happier with a typewriter that once she buys it and, and knows how to use it, nobody's going to come in and change that typewriter on her. So Kevin John's story was very effective. We all resonated with it, right? We all understood it. You can do the same. Take a, take a moment after this talk as a piece of homework to figure out what your core story is. And the best way to figure that out is take a few minutes and make a list of the stories you told Friday night at the reception. As you got to time where you're sharing with other people, what stories were interesting to build connection with people? What did you find yourself telling? Make a list of those stories. Work on it. It should be a list that's 40 or 50 stories long that are the stories you find that you tell frequently. And then figure out how they can relate to your talk, to your subject. Somehow, someway, one of those stories will be an excellent example for what you do. Here's an example. May I tell you a story? <laughs> yes, you don't have a choice. Thank you. I'm glad your filter is broken because it's uh, definitely not working now. <laughs> but among stories, I had the, the pleasure, as you might have guessed, this is a skiing story, of going on a tour with a college friend of mine, and we went around to seven different ski resorts in seven days, all through the, the northwest part of the, the country. And we ended up at a place called Bridger Bowl. It is outside of Montana. It is a rather small resort by Colorado Mountain Standards, and it has a large ridge line. To get on that ridge line, you have to be wearing an avalanche beacon, a device on your body that beeps, beep, beep, so they can find you. And to get on the chairlift, you have to hold a sensor next to the beeper so that the gate will open. If you don't have one of those, they can't find you, therefore you don't go up. Now that might tell you, Maybe this is a little bit steep. This is not normal. Ski areas don't require these things. This is the first ski area I went to that you had to prove that you were beeping to get up there. We get up on the top, and sure enough, it is 78 degrees, an angle just about like that. Way down there are trees. 
And I'm looking with my buddy, who's, who's up, I'm up there with, we're going to die. No, I didn't really say that. I was, I was being macho. I'm ski patrol. I can do this. Well, he used to be ski patrol, too. In fact, step back a few years. He is the one who got me onto the ski patrol. He's the one that I first met in high school when we were in a youth program together, and he played the, the state governor while I was a state senator, and he had the nerve to veto my bill going through the legislature. I never forgot that face. Jump ahead five years later, I'm in graduate school, and I sit down in a classroom across from him. You, you vetoed my bill. <laughs> that started a lifetime friendship. He was the director of the ski patrol. He got me on ski patrol. He taught me how to ski. When we were out skiing, we'd, we'd always have this phrase, up to it. It was this, the call to action to jump out and go do something. So all of a sudden, now we are up on this ridge. We've been skiing together for three days. We're both a little tired. The legs are jelly. They don't work much anymore. And oh my gosh, we're going all the way down there. There's a tree there. There's a tree there. There's another tree there. We can be a pinball. Bing, ding, ding, ding. You lose a ski, no way you're climbing all the way back up. So, conservative. Do we just slide it and just uh, go slow? All of a sudden I hear, up to it. Boom, we're off. Later. So you start with a story. This story will have meaning in a moment. And yes, we did survive the trip. In fact, we started screaming like high school kids again. Wahoo! We're having a great time on the hill. But it is the story that helps people relate to you, to understand that you have common experience. Tonight, there is a competition that, that will be going on, and we'll be going into how you might prepare for it. So this group will have a teaser, an inside edge, on how to do well with Brian Tiemann's program tonight, because we're going to cover that in just a moment. But the purpose of the stories, the purpose that you can draw out of your story, particularly your core story, the story that most relates to your heart, is to, to tell your why. We are, our president, Sarah, has been very, very uh, strong on helping us as a project try to rediscover our why. It's important to us. It's important to build the connection with why we are out in the community. It's important to attract new developers, to be someone who's putting in a brick in that wall right next to us, and that together we can build a bigger and better wall. You need people to relate together and connect with each other. So starting with it, why is important, and Simon Sinek's TED Talk is exquisite for that. So if you haven't seen it, go see it. But in particular, it builds this connection that, that this quote from Simon talks about. It's, it is about how you can have that connection and have that commonality of purpose. Because once people relate to you and have that common spirit, that common shared ambition, that shared passion, they want to buy from you. You're not selling to them anymore with the, the big capital S like a used car salesman. You're helping people find solutions. You are trying to build camaraderie relationships. You're trying to make friends. So it is important to find that opportunity and, and work together. With that, the, the, part of the importance of starting with that is that you have to be your authentic self. Only Brian can get away with wearing some of the outfits he does. But Brian, at the same time that he is doing that on those stage performances, he is not trying to be a credible, authoritative expert. He is being up there to entertain. And yes, your role in speaking is to try to do three things. Entertain, inspire, and educate. And he's got entertainment nailed. It gets to be a lot of fun to watch Brian when he really gets on. Uh, so tonight might be one of those opportunities as he's back there preparing and, and going, oh shit, now I'm, now I'm teed up. <laughs> so if you are not a stand-up comic, you cannot use humor, maybe tangentially, but it, do not start with a joke. People say, start with a joke, start with humor, break the ice. No, that is something that is taught in some Toastmasters groups. 
but it does not work. You have to be your authentic self. And people will connect because you share a part of yourself. You get to, get to know each other. Public speaking is a whole set of one-on-one -on -one conversations where you are actually talking to one person in the room at a time, and they feel a personal connection. And so does somebody else. And it is, they feel like, oh my gosh, he's just talking to me. So it's you know, clearly, public speaking is just that simple process. And actually, that's part of what reduces the fear factor of being up in front of so many people and having them all undress you because you're mentally undressing them. It's only fair. Uh, so. But uh, it really is about building that emotional connection. So there's a couple different ways to connect. One of those is by making that list of stories, you have the rabbit in the hat. You have the solution for all those awkward times that you get on stage, you forgot what you were talking about, or a question took you off on a side path, and oh my gosh, I've got to recover. Stories put you back to center. You have your two or three stories that you know you want to share with an audience on the list, on the podium, that all else goes wrong, the slides stop working, you, your brain stops working, your mouth stops working, you go back to home base and you tell one of those stories and that's how you can recover. So find those stories. They, they end up solving things. And there is a formula for a story that if you take the time and choose two or three of your stories to do this with, you will actually find a structure to, to use in storytelling. One of those structures is called the story spine. And this is a a formula for telling stories that has been adopted in Hollywood. It has been adopted in a lot of uh, playwrights and um, uh, different people like that. And it all begins with the phrase, once upon a time. And it moves on to every day, your leader, your character, your, your hero does something that is what's considered normal. It is the routine. And so between once upon a time and the setting of, of the story, the context that you are in, the characters that we're about to learn about. This guy, Jack, that I went to high school with, you know, this, this mountain that we're looking down is so steep, and that normal skiing is something we do every day as ski patrollers, and it just gets old and boring, it's never ever challenging anymore, that all of a sudden it's a new and different and exciting experience. So you get that every day. I'm a ski patroller on the hill, and all of a sudden it's not as, not as um, you know, it's just routine. Jump to the movie The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is having that everyday life. She wishes she could be somewhere over the rainbow. She dreams about a better life someplace else. She wants this. But every day she's in the same old boring canvas. And then, one day, the tornado comes. The transition happens. Something comes along to be the incident that you're going to build your story around. Something has changed. The beeper opened the gate. You go out there. The tornado puts you in this place called Oz, and you find out that you have to go on a journey. And because of having landed in Oz, you have to go find the wizard, because he's the one who can get you home. And so you go off on a journey. And this is the protagonist's journey, and you're gonna go through this series of challenges on this journey. And in your storytelling, you come up with these challenges and how they are conquered. You do one challenge if it's a very short story. You do five, six, seven challenges if it's a long story. And each of those challenges has meaning to your final message. So you just repeat the cycle as necessary to have as, much, as many examples to meet your goal. And you repeat that because there are many obstacles on a typical journey. And, you find, and Dorothy finally gets, gets to the objective. She meets the wizard. And the wizard says, you must go kill the wicked witch. Oh my gosh, another obstacle. So because another obstacle was found, we have to tell another part of the story. And all of a sudden she finds flying monkeys and trees that throw apples and all kinds of scary things. But she continues on this journey until finally the wicked witch is dead. She returns to Oz. And now, of course, fulfilling the promise, the wizard is about to fly her home in his balloon, and she misses the ride. 
So that unexpected surprise means that you know, it's, you've got an unexpected result as part of the story that you are telling. So you get from the moment of truth to the moral of the story. The moral of the story of the Wizard of Oz was she was in Kansas the entire time. She had it in her own power to click her heels, and she could have done it from day one and just been transported back to where she wanted to be, that nice, safe home among the people that love her. So there is a moral to all stories, and the moral is your message. So as you wish to convey an, an idea to somebody, you end with a moral that relates to the goal of the audience, it relates to the transition that you want to, the transformation you would like your audience to, to be inspired to make. To set someone up for your one and only one call to action. Your story, your speaking slot, your keynote, is not effective unless you have a call to action that you inspire people to take. So have a goal. Understand what your objective is. Make sure you get there. At the start of the story, or at the start of the presentation, you are making a promise. I made a promise to you that by the end of this talk, you would be a better speaker. I didn't state it because I used a lousy introduction. But on an instant replay, my opening statement would be, by the end of this talk, I expect you to be entertained, inspired, and educated on being a better speaker. And at the end of this talk, if I have delivered on those three things, I expect a perfect score on the rating card. Now, I, I have just set myself up for success. How many of you go to conferences, speak from a stage, and you know there's going to be an evaluation form. And you get the forms back and you get threes and fours. That's a good. That's a good. You want perfect fives? You set that expectation. That statement I just made. If I deliver on entertaining, inspiring, and educating you, this will have been a perfect talk. Do you agree? Do you agree? At the end of this talk, if I've met all those things, you will probably fill out all fives. You will, you will mark accordingly because we delivered on the promise. So use that. Build on that. Uh, when you download the slides, this will give you the reference to what we just went through, this story spine process. It is a framework to, to tell stories around. As you, as you look to the stories that you like to tell, figure out how to dissect them and reassemble them into the sequence that, the, that is just like this, and kind of do little outlines until you have told that story enough times that it works really well. I do not have a clock up here, so how am I doing on time? Good. I'm at the halfway point. We are at number six. Excellent. <laughs> Please. The question was, can, can you sustain a story for two or three hours through a full workshop? And can you, can you really you know, build in enough chapters to a story? And the answer is just like a good movie or a good book that will keep you engaged. You have chapters to your story, and you can break it apart. So each chapter, each part of the journey has its own little piece of story that ties to the message that you want to deliver. You have an objective for for the fourth uh, quarter hour, and so you've got a little bit of, a, of an obstacle in the journey to talk about, and then you talk about how it's overcome. And in overcoming the obstacle, you know, the, the release of Juma 3.7.2, and, and the challenges that you overcome, and how, how fast you had to get all the testers to respond, you know, that's just part of the journey. And then you go into, okay, how do we speed up the release cycle process the next time we have an urgent release. Go ahead. The goal of the race has to grow. There's a lot of stuff happening there all the way. Yes. So, and, so your story breaks apart. And it, you, you use it to, to launch each topic. And so you know, take time to break it apart. Each part is an obstacle, a solution. And then the solution is what you're teaching. So you go into your teaching mode. And then you go back to the story. 
And so in our, when our hero was faced with that, our hero was able to do this. And then he came across the next obstacle, our next topic. Eye contact. How many people in here think that I have made eye contact with you in the course of this talk already? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. <laughs> I'm just seeing whose hands are still down. Make sure I got you. <laughs> there is an art to making eye contact in a room that is this size that is really quite, quite effective. I would like everyone to put your hands in the air and keep them in the air until you feel I have made con eye contact with you personally starting now. And so as soon as you feel I have made eye contact with you, start putting your hand down. What are you waiting for? Oh, now, there you go, okay. And how are we doing over here? Don't quite have everyone in this corner, but I'm gonna get the last two over here, got them knocked off, and we're gonna go over there. Okay, I'm on, I've got that group. Well, you know, a couple people are slow. <laughs> All right, I had to make six hits. Because I looked at one person, and six people around him put their hands down. I looked at one person, and the six around put their hands down. It's because you can't really tell exactly where I'm looking. But if I focus on one person, there is a cone of, group, of people there that will all think I'm looking at them, even though I'm at one person. Same here. There's a cone of people all around that, that don't realize the person I'm really choosing to pick on. And likewise over here. Use that effectively. Eye contact does not work unless you've got three seconds. So really focus and lock on one person. If you keep jumping around the room, they don't quite realize and think that you're talking to them personally. But the moment you really focus on somebody, they start to get a little nervous. They grin a little bit. They, they know that they maybe should be heckling right now. And uh, <laughs> they get fine up. <laughs> and then they... <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Next, there is an opportunity to use brain science. You've heard about left and right brain. As neurosciences have advanced in the last couple of years, they no longer speak of left and right brain. It is left and right hemisphere. Because what they are finding is under functional magnetic resonance imaging, where they are scanning the brain to see, see where activity is happening that as people are exposed to certain kinds of stimuli, that both sides of the brain are firing. It's just the predominant activity will be on one side, and the, there's a, but there's still an activity on the other side. So both sides of the brain get, spire, get fired and get inspired. We traditionally talk about a left-brained activity or a left-hemisphere activity as being very analytical, very data-centric. And we talk about the right side as being very story-oriented. Our right brain is where we have creativity. It's where our imagination resides. It is our softer side. Those who are more right brain centric tend to be the artists of our group. And I do believe in this group there are a number of artists. I had to call them code poets. Code poetry is as much an art as it is a science. And so yes, you may paint exquisite pictures with code. You use just the same way as you can paint exquisite pictures with the written word in a story or on the screen with video. So it is on that side that you have the emotional connection. You have empathy. So when I'm telling a story, I want to be spe speaking to your right brain. To do that, I want to be speaking primarily to your left eye, and it will cycle over to your right brain, because they cross paths. So, to speak to the right brain, you, you speak to the left eye. And likewise, when you get to the other side of the brain, um, the left brain is our primordial brain that works on patterns. We find food by being able to, to find the pair of eyes in the forest of trees, the unusual thing that stands out. We have a brain that goes into overdrive looking for patterns. It is pattern recognition that gives us the thrill at a slot machine, because we think well, our brain can find a pattern to how every time we pull the handle and the wheels are turning, that they will lock 
and there, we know the next one will be the jackpot. We know it's going to happen. We found the pattern. It has to be the next one. Even though logically we all know it is just random. If there is a pattern, we will find it and we will get a dopamine release. Chemical in the brain that makes us feel good. If we look for a pattern and can't find it, we get a four times dopamine release. We go into overdrive looking for it, and we get that happy sauce going that makes it very addictive looking for that pattern. We look for that pattern, for 85% of you, every morning when we check social media. That is the random reward that you can actually design around. It's unpredictable what you might get each day, therefore you will check it each day. It becomes addictive to you. So it is that part of the brain that you, you work with on the data side because you're trying to find the analytics of the process and, and work on logic. So as you work from a stage, you can actually take advantage of all this. Presuming this will change. That when you work stage right, this is the great place to be telling stories from. Due to another point I'm going to come to, you're going to see why I'm not using stage left. But when you're ready to give information that is more analytical, you want to be stage left so that you're talking to the other eye that goes to the left side of the brain. So tell your data, your graphs, your analytical information, the numbers from this corner of the stage. Don't talk as you walk. And get to this side when you want to tell a story and to build that emotional connection and to have people wonder about how steep that really was. You shift back and forth to the part of the brain that you most want to be speaking to. So this is my story side. Stage right because I want to talk to your right brain. So it's my right side, we'll talk to your right brain. And it's stage left when I want to talk to your left brain and give you data, give you information. I start with story because I want to build the emotional connection because that's what necessi is necessary to drop your filters, to allow you to even receive the information and start to process it. Now you're, because I have, show, have shared a story, because we have a connection, because there is some trust, now you're opening to hear, hearing what I have to say and you're not going to immediately go, oh, that's not true. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Nah, can't be. So you start right away with building the bridge so that you can cross it and actually give information. And the filters are down and they're ready to be received. And then finally, when you're ready to, get, to pose a question to the audience and actually get some interaction on it, you present from the center of the stage. How many of you would find it interesting to know that both sides of your brain work? Raise your hands. Both sides of your brain are working all the time. So you ask a question from the center because from the center you are firing both sides of the brain. The analytical will be doing this thing, the story side will be doing some recall, oh, have I ever heard that before, or, or is that true, and, you know, do I have a, a re an experience in my life that I can relate to? The two are doing battle, the corpus callosum right in the center is just, you know, neurons are firing back and forth, it's having a good time. That's where you get a whole lot of engagement. So. You work both sides, and you'll have both sides producing results. Same goes for slides, especially when the button on the slides works, which it's not going to do for the moment. But as you work on presenting, your slide deck will be, well, it needs to be separated left and right, as you might have seen earlier. I need to be on this side to tell a story. I need photographs, pretty pictures, images to be on the left side of the slide for exactly the same reason. And I need my text, my analytical information, my charts and graphs and bullets to be on the right side to speak to that side of the brain. So backwards to what we're used to in slide design. We're used to putting the margin right here because the left side never moves on us. It's nice and easy. And then we put the, the photo here because the text will wrap around it so nicely. The software is designed to do that. It's easy but it doesn't 
meet the needs of your audience quite as well. So take the time to use it. Yes, please. <laughs> Consider yourself excused. <laughs> That's it, no problem. Next, particularly challenging on this stage is to find your light and to know where it is. This is an actor's technique that many speakers don't quite realize. When you walk into a space that you're going to be speaking in, take a moment in advance, well in advance, to become prepared with the space. I came in here yesterday and did my sound check. David was very helpful. We, we were able to find audio levels. We plugged in. I made sure my slides were going to be square on the screen instead of stretched wide, like, as I saw with some other presentations. You do all that well in advance so you've got time to adjust. And so then when it becomes time for your presentation, you've got time to instead be up here worrying about it, to be out talking to your audience, to be making connections. Glad to see you, Frank. Glad you could come here today. How's it going? And, and you're out here getting to know people before your presentation has even started because, actually, you have started your presentation. Your presentation starts the moment you arrive at the event. It's when you're meeting your customers before you go in the conference room. So you take the time to get connected with your audience, and you, do, you can do that because all of your setup was done in advance. So in advance, you walk around with your hand and see where the light hits it. Those of you who were at the World Conference might remember those rooms were horrible for light. The light came straight down. People had deep, dark raccoon eyes, shadows on their faces. If they stepped forward the least little bit, they were in perfect shadow, and the wall was beautifully lit and well exposed. Camera operators have a real challenge if, you're, if they're producing video. If the background on your slide is white, and they and you are not very well lit you will look extremely dark silhouetted almost invisible and the screen will be so washed out you can't read the text so both are wrong so in general when you're speaking to a large group and you're trying to compose both and have the camera see it you need to to balance that this really should be black text on a lighter blue background no it should be the other way around the background should be darker and it's so the text can stay light so ideally, I would actually have a much darker background, as was used last night. So with that, you're finding your light. One of the challenges of this space is this light right here. You never want to be in it. You don't want to be showing shadows on the screen. Fortunately, with a back, black background or a dark background, it's not as obvious. If, I, if this was truly a black background slide, I can stand here and not have an issue. How many were in Barcelona? You might remember at the J Oscars in Barcelona that we were all able to walk across the street, stage and do all kinds of, of activity on the stage. The reason why was that for the, the screen was the same height, but we had a black panel going clear up to here, and the slides started from here up. So we used only a small area of the projector screen. So we could stand in front of it and not have shadows be cast, and not have strange light on the people on the stage. Done by design. So take that into account. Find where the lighting is on the stage and stay in it. Figure out in advance where the sweet spots are. This one, this stage, is pretty even lighting. There's not much that's going to be an advantage in one spot over the other. But there are some rooms where if you position just right, you might get the light optimum for, for how it should look on your face. If you get too far forward, you get shadows. You get back far enough, it's pretty, it gets back to even. So find the right places to be and own your stage. Also with that, you need to remove distractions. Everything is noise. You'll notice these slides do not have a logo at the bottom. They did not have tweet us at, you know, JW, you know, JB17, you know, all those things. We don't have the date on the bottom. We don't have the slide number. Remove noise from your slides. Just the message you want to say. Remove as many words as possible. When speaking to an international audience, words are helpful. I may speak too fast, as I typically do sometimes, for some people for whom English is not their first language to be able to follow me. 
But if the core message is also on the screen, they've got time to read it and absorb the screen. Go, oh, that's what he's talking about. And then they catch up with what's being said. So your screen can have a few words to help the audience stay with you. When I speak to, in the US, to a United States only audience, many of my talks have no words. They are only photographs. It's because I use those photographs to tell stories. I need the slides to help me remember where I am in my program and what I want to talk about next. The audience doesn't know what's coming, but all of a sudden that slide shows up like it might tonight, and you've got to weave your story to match the slide, and you've, that opportunity is met. So I use slides to keep, keep myself on track, and also to help you follow along. So there are 10 items. We are working our way through the numbers. We're down to the last couple, and we still have plenty, a little bit of time left, so we're working through okay. But with that, stay in your light. Podiums are a terrible thing unless you've got a computer that you've got to touch directly. So I prefer to have a, a clicker. In fact, my ideal setup, when I may have it, is I like to have what's called a confidence monitor. This is the, the computer screen that's here, down in front of me, or it's clear on the back wall, where I can see on the back wall what you see. And in addition, what's on the back wall is run, I usually use two computers to do this. Two computers have the exact same show, except my one on the back wall will have not only what's on the screen, but it might have two or three words of reminder notes to me of how to start the next thing I want to say. It only takes three words of the first sentence to remember, oh, that's what I want to say now. That I, I get to know what I want to present well enough because I've worked on it far enough in advance that, that there are, it doesn't take much to remind me what comes next. But with that back confidence monitor, if I get derailed, I can see those three words and know, oh, that's what I need to do next. And then when that system doesn't work, you have your emergency story <laughs> to fill the time until you get back on track. So confidence monitors are nice. They're very, very helpful. To, to do that, mechanically, I, use, I buy two sets of clickers that are the exact same brand, exact same style, same frequency. And I put the little hub, nub in the two different computers, so one click from the stage advances both computers in sync. And that works beautifully to keep both of them changing slides at exactly the same time. For those of you who worked, who, who saw the first Ignite, that's exactly how we ran it in Boston. So one computer, one computer, one clicker, advanced both sets of slides. And to the speakers that were on stage, they had a confidence monitor down front that they could see the timer for how long they had until the next slide came and what the next slide was going to be. So they were, could be on, on target and ready for the next step. So these are all tricks when you have a big stage. You don't always want to be working with a big stage. Sometimes you're here to do presentations. You're here to, to educate people more than to inspire them. And so with that, you can take tips from photographers. I'm a photographer. You're one. We all aspire to get that perfect image, that one that's, that gets you right there on the sunset, you know, imperfect silhouette, good contrast, good color, good composition, all those things that photographers aspire for. Videographers aspire to do the exact same thing with every frame of their video. If they're good, there are no bad images in an entire video. The really good videographers, you can actually go frame by frame through a movie and notice how well composed every single shot and setup is. It's phenomenally well done. As a speaker, what can we draw from this? What makes a good photograph is what draws our eye. What draws our eye is stark contrast. You get stark contrast as a speaker by doing a number of different things. One is that you change your volume, your voice volume. Sometimes you're telling the story of how exciting it is to be looking way down, and oh my gosh, you don't know how you're going to recover from this. And sometimes you're telling a secret, and it's, it's just you know, that low voice, that intimate connection. 
Sometimes you're speaking really, really fast because, you know, you just got to get the excitement going and, and that part of the program is very important to you. And sometimes you slow it down. And sometimes you make your point and pause. One, two, three. The pause emphasizes the point. It's the takeaway. It gives the audience's brain time to catch up, time to take in what was just said. And rather than distract them away from that emerging thought, by going to your next one, you give it time to set. Give it time to soak in. So present an idea, go through your buildup, get your, get your story going that supports it. They will, they will not remember your point, but they will remember the mom with the typewriter and how much better she felt with the typewriter. And then they remember your point of don't change once they buy it. So the points are well remembered when there is a story. If the point is there is no UI, that might not soak in a week from now. You might not remember that from that talk, but you'll remember the typewriter and, and how instrumental that was in our industry. So you find contrast in storytelling. You switch context. You find contrast in how you use the stage. So part of this, you're doing battle because sometimes you have to find your light and not step in front of the screen <laughs> and screw things up with your slides. But sometimes you get to a point and you make a point. Moving on the stage, the more you move around, the more you own the room, the more confident you appear, the more authoritative you, hear, you appear, the less someone needs to hear your credentials, the less someone needs to actually have all that biographical stuff, because you've already convinced them. You don't need to know I have four degrees. Who cares? That just meant I didn't know how to go to work. <laughs> it is that kind of contrast that, that comes along. And so in storytelling and in pre presenting in general, find the ways to have contrast. We've talked about vocal contrast. It's the rate. It's the pitch. It's the highs and it's the lows. So vary, vary it around. We talk about positional contrast, where I am on the stage, and sometimes how I can use the stage to make that cliff look even taller. Oh my gosh. And sometimes it is time. When I was telling that story, I started on the cliff. Oh my gosh, we're going to die. <laughs> and then I told you about who was standing next to me. And I went back in time. And I intentionally took a step backwards to visually give you the signal. I was moving back in time. And then part of that was to then tell you about this person next to me and our history together, to build the story leading up to that. If I started with this guy named Jack, who'd have cared? But if I'm next to the guy who's about to die with me, oh, now he's relevant. So, so that's why the story starts to make sense. And then you've got the structural component, the story spine. And we had obstacles. We had trees below us. We were about to die. We had obstacles. So, and then there was the transition where we came out of that. So you use all those to, to find contrast. We also have grown up in a, in a world of television. All of us have become mentally conditioned, whether you realize it or not, that if you grew up with a television in the household, at any point in your life, you have an eight minute timer, the time between commercial breaks. And it seems like every story told on television has been structured that when you get to eight minutes, there has to be a two minute break. You might be going to the bathroom, you might be you know, refreshing the coffee. More importantly, it is the mental time to disconnect and absorb what was just pre presented. It is the time for you in a one hour talk to not take a break. You don't have that, that luxury. But it is time to change it up, to switch to telling a story, to switch to asking a question, to do something that changes the energy in the room, to do a simple trick like 
Everyone stand up a second. It's going to wake him up. Stand up a second. Stand up. Do it. Get on it. On your feet. Take a moment to reach as high as you can. As absolutely high as you can. All right. I have a, a hundred Zlotties for anyone who can reach higher. Who can reach higher? Come on. He's the winner. Why didn't you reach the highest? <laughs> What did that accomplish? We got the break done. <laughs> we broke up the room. We got oxygen back flowing. We woke him up. <laughs> we had our transition. You had time to absorb thoughts. He had time to reach a higher, higher height than he had previously. And you also all realized that even though you said you had reached the highest you could, you could go higher. So we all can reach higher. And with that, you use the eight minutes. Block out your talk, find where eight minutes will likely land, and plan an activity that is different. Switch into your storytelling mode, ready to jump off the cliff right at eight minutes. Switch into getting people to exercise and reach their hands at the next eight minutes. There is magic to doing that, and it helps you know, keep you on track. <clears throat> Finally, practice does make perfect. It is important. You need to, to truly own a topic. You need to not be thinking about it while you're on the stage. You need to know it so well that at any point in time, at the bar, out at dinner, I can start talking about the things that are important to me in my life. And they come easily. I don't have to think about how to tell somebody what I do every day. It comes. I don't have to, because I have enough experience with this talk, I don't have to think about how to present it to you. It is coming to me. All I have to do is remember what the next topic is, and a slide helps me do that. So with that, if you have enough rehearsal time, use it. Use a video camera. Don't rehearse right on the day of your event or the day before. Do it a week out. Practice giving it then. And your, your brain, your subconscious brain will go into overdrive organizing things. And it will start to set in. And you will have better ideas if you get your slides done a week out than if you do them a day before. That extra time will help you set up great ideas that help you to really perfect your, your presentation. Remember to recover with interactivity. If you don't quite remember where you're at, ask your audience. Who can reach, the, you know, reach as high as you can? Do something that, that will change things. Or how many in here actually use both sides of their brain? You know, it gets a laugh. It gets a little bit of a surprise. And uh, it also lets you recover from things, like the, the button that's not going to click. Go ahead. Just be that way. And maybe it's going to sleep. Finally, in designing your talk, have a big idea. This is the promise. This is what you're going to deliver to this audience. You don't have to explicitly say it, but have the goal. What is your call to action? What is it you want people to do? What, are you trying to create an inspiration to go have people follow you on your journey? Are you trying to get more people to be working on the project? You want more people to work on your pull request? Whatever it might be, have the goal, and then build everything up leading to the goal. Have that big idea, set it up at the beginning, and then at the end, deliver on it. Make sure that you have fulfilled on that big idea. It's part of how you, you measure your success. It's part of how you get all those fives on your scorecard. So, we've kind of taken questions as going along, but are there any questions at this point? You sure? Time's up, Frank. Thanks. <laughs> it is to end with an ending. A strong thing that you can do in your presentation is not to end with, oh, gee, are your questions, and then let the audience wander you through a pathway of unrelated topics that don't really cement and emphasize your final points. You want to come back and end with an ending, which I am doing right now. I'm going to come back and remind you of some of the things we talked about, like find your light, 
like have a story, like build emotional connection, have an ending that helps people remember the primary point of the talk. Be prepared so that you can walk in comfortable and confident and have time to talk to the people in the room instead of fighting with your equipment and the button that just won't click. And most part, important part, try to have fun. Presentations are more fun if you are also having a good time on the screen trying to touch the button that will not touch. Because everyone has a button touching experience that they can relate to. So with that, I thank you. Go out, be a great presenter.